Hello and welcome to another episode of The Distinguished Geek. If you're new to the channel, welcome and please don't hesitate to uh, subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Uh, this channel focuses on anything that you label as geek, so that could be from comics to movies to video games and anything that you class as iconic and geek. Uh, this channel is focusing on Marvel at the moment uh, and we're talking about the life of Marvel, how Marvel began back in 1939 and moving into 2003. Uh, today's episode is about 1955, so let's get started. as an act of self-defense against a hostile bombardment from the public about the comics being published for children with violence, the publishers banded together as the Comics Magazines Association of America and formed the Comics Code Authority, or the CAA. With the CAA, the publishers could police their own comics, and any comics that they deemed to be too violent were sent to the publishers to be pulped, and any comics that passed the censorship were stamped with a CAA of approval on the front covers. In March, Rawhide Kid issue number one was released. Now, Rawhide Kid wasn't very successful when it first appeared, but it was very durable. It lasted until the fall of Atlas and the rise of Marvel in 1957. It was revived and somewhat improved in August 1960 thanks to the popularity of the television series Rawhide starring none other than Clint Eastwood. With the knock-on effect of the Comic Code's authority, the Westerns were the most affected. One of the conditions attached to the agreement of the Comic Code Authority was that nobody within a comic can shoot another person, which made it particularly difficult for Westerns as it was riddled with gunslingers. This resulted in ridiculous gunfights, in which the hero would find him or herself in situations where misdirection or using objects around them to their advantage, such as shooting ropes on chandeliers to drop on the villains, or spooking horses with gunfire to trample the bad guys. In April, My Girl Pearl issue number one was released. This was a series that Stanley originated with artist Dan DiCarlo, who worked on most of the comedy teen series, such as Josie and the Pussycats, Millie the Model, and Sabrina the Teenage Witch for Archie Comics. Margot Pearl was a stereotyped blonde who wasn't very bright. The series rolled out story after story on Pearl's inability to grasp onto day-to-day -day life. The series ran for four issues, it returned as an encore, if you will, in July 1957 with two more issues and then returned for a third time in August 1960 with five more issues. In May, Black Knight issue number one was released. By far, one of the most remembered series of this period. Remembered as it may have been, it was still a short-lived series. The Black Knight printed the adventures of Sir Percy of Scandia, who at night, under the cover of darkness, harnessed an enchanted armour bestowed upon him by Merlin to defend Camelot from Mordred the Evil. Stanley gave birth to his crusader and wrote the first issue using Old English dialect, which eventually characterised Thor in a not so distant future where he debuted in August 1962. In July, Atlas began to tame their comic series in the aftermath of the aggressive onslaught towards the comic industry. Atlas needed to find another trend to replace the comic series to keep the profits coming in. And one area they were looking at was the television. Television was becoming very popular with TV shows orientated around family and children. So it made sense for Atlas to publish a comic based on a TV show. Atlas chose a children's TV show called The Adventures of Pinky Lee. 
but the series only lasted for five issues. October brought the end of the Submariner. Martin Goodman, the publisher of Atlas, had been in talks with television executives hoping to bring the adventures of Submariner to life in the live action television series. Supposedly to start Richard Egan. For those who are too young to know who he was, he starred in such films as Pollyanna with Hayley Mills, 300 Spartans, and Love Me Tender with Elvis Presley. The talks unfortunately went round in circles, resulting with the end of the Submariner's extended run with issue number 42. In November, Snafu issue number one was released. Now what the hell is Snafu, I hear you asking? Well, Snafu is a military term meaning situation normal or fouled up. A tame version of Fubar from Saving Private Ryan meaning fucked up beyond all recognition. That one rolls off the tongue a bit better, but I don't think that would have gone down too well if it was printed. Snafu starred Irving Forbush, a mascot, an alter ego, if you will, for the Marvel comics, which was a parody for the Marvel comics. A little experiment the Marvel were trying to do, but it lasted for three issues. The question in the last episode was, it was the maiden flight for which plane in 1954? And the answer was the Boeing 707. And for the bonus questions, it was, what was the company who made the plane, which obviously is Boeing, and where did it take off from? And that was Seattle. Unfortunately, no one answered the question correctly, so we'll move on to this week's question, which is, what theory by Christopher Crockerell was tested in 1955? And for the bonus question, it is, how did Christopher Crockerell test his hypothesis? If you leave the answer in the comments below, and I'll feature your name in the next episode. Once again, thank you very much for watching. Please like, share and subscribe so you don't miss another episode. Thanks guys and I'll see you soon. Goodbye. The end.